And uh, next, I want to invite our next speaker, Dr. Cliff Sadoff. So Cliff has been uh, a professor of entomology at Purdue University, working on insect pests of urban landscapes since 1999 or not 1990. He has conducted an active research program on both the biological and chemical control of emerald ash borer. His group developed the web-based emerald ash borer cost calculator to help city foresters plan their management of emerald ash borer. And if you haven't checked that out, you really should. It's a great resource. He is the co-author of the Regional Bulletin on Chemical Control of EAB and runs the National Emerald Ash Borer website series with his Midwestern colleagues. He is the lead entomologist for the Purdue Plant Doctor app series that helps landscape managers to improve their diagnosis of pest problems and delivery of appropriate management solutions. So uh, without further ado, I would like to turn it over to you, Cliff. Thank you so okay. much for joining us today. So today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, understanding chemical control of emerald ash borers. I think a lot of you probably have heard an awful lot about um, Okay, what's going on here? PowerPoint, come on. Next slide. Okay, uh, you've all heard a lot about emerald ash borer uh, over the over the years. It's uh, caused quite a bit of a stir in uh, Kentucky already. I know, and uh, this is the a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is inside this manual that I put together with Dan Herbs, Deb McCulloch, and my other colleagues, and uh, we talk about all the options that are available for chemical control of emerald ash borer. But what I want to do today is I want to talk a little bit more about the theory about how uh, the chemicals actually work uh, and specifically how long they work and uh, how we could use them in management programs that would uh, cause protection, uh, allow protection for a, a longer period of time. And then finally, uh, what I want to talk about is something called SLAM. Uh, slowed ash mortality. Some of you might be familiar with some of the research that's been done in this area in forests in uh, northern Michigan in the Upper Peninsula, where uh, you know you, <clears throat> they only treat a, a small fraction of the ash trees in order to protect all the ash trees. And I'm going to talk about how that works using some examples that I have done uh, with my team uh, in a number of college campuses uh, at Purdue, uh, Michigan, in, in Indiana, just just north of the river. So um, let's talk now about how insecticides kill emerald ash borer. I'm sure uh, you're familiar with the life cycle of the emerald ash borer. Right now, uh, you'll see that uh, in the, the wintertime, the emerald ash borer should be in the, uh, the larval stage or the pupil stage uh, or, uh, beneath the, the bark. And then uh, when it gets warm, the, uh, the uh, adults will, will, will come out. Uh, in May, uh, they make their characteristic D-shaped exit holes, and then uh, the males and the females will mate. And then after that, the uh, females will start to feed on the leaves. And this is really important from the standpoint of chemical control, because uh, if you can get a poison into that leaf uh, and have the adult feed uh, uh, on those leaves before they lay eggs, you'll kill it before it lays eggs. And that's really what we want to do because we want to prevent those eggs that are laid in July. And uh, But if you uh, miss it and you apply material after the eggs are laid, this product does also kill, these products will also kill the larvae that are feeding beneath the bark. So uh, there are a number of insecticides that are available, uh, the uh, including uh, you know, imidacloprid uh, and Dinotefiram, which are neonicotinoids, which are applied to the soil. Uh, and then there's emamectin benzoate, which is a whole different class, uh, which is tr applied as a tree injection, a trunk injection, as well as azadiractin, which is also applied as a trunk injection. None of these products kill the eggs. All the products kill the first two in the first two stages of the larvae, so the, the young larvae. Uh, but uh, only emamectin benzoate and uh, azadiractin will kill all life stages of the larvae. So that's important to know that uh, if you can get uh, insecticide into the, uh, 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 the uh, xylem and uh, so it, it translocates into the phloem uh, at any time of the year, you will kill uh, larvae if you use emamectin benzoate or if you use azadiractin. 
Uh, what's interesting is that azadiractin does not kill the adults, but it does reduce the, the fecundity of the adult females. Uh, amamectin benzoate is, is the most toxic to the emerald ash borer, and that's really important because because we kill them with only one or two bites of, of, of foliar feeding, uh, it's very likely to kill these things before they lay eggs if you put the material out early enough in the year. So the question you might want to ask is, well, how long does this protection last? Well, if you look, first of all, if you look on, on the left, uh, the tree on the left is an ash tree. Uh, the DBH is about 40 inches. And the tree on the right is another, is also an ash, but it wasn't treated with emamectin benzoate. So this product really works. And uh, I'm going to show you the results uh, from a chemical study that I did in this particular location in Eagle Creek up, uh, up further north on uh, 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 I-65. But before I do that, I want to talk about uh, the results of my colleague's study, uh, Deb McCulloch. Uh, she did some work in some real forests, not the kind of places where I work, uh, usually cities, uh, but she uh, worked uh, with forest-grown green ash, uh, and she had eight different replicates of, uh, of, uh, of trees that ranged anywhere from about 21 to 31 inches in diameter at breast height. And uh, they compared dinotefuran, which is as safari as a basal trunk spray, imicide, which is a midacloprid that was injected into the trunk, as well as a, a, a emamectin benzoate triage injections. Uh, they started it in 2008, and then they felled the trees in 2014. And what they did was with each of these three treatments, some of the treatments they applied every single, uh, once every three years, which is what we call triennial in this graph over here. And then others, which uh, products was applied once every, uh, once every year, and that was the annual. So uh, for the imidacloprid products, uh, they, so what they did was they, they, they peeled the bark in, in uh, 2014, and they counted the number of live larvae per meter squared that was underneath the bark. So basically in the control you see here on the left, uh, the uh, tall bar here says there's about 35 larvae per meter squared if you did nothing, if you put no insecticides on there, which was exactly the same amount that you had left if you applied dinotefuran once every three years. So you have to apply dinotefuran more frequently when you apply it annually, basically there are very few larvae uh, uh, left. Uh, Imidacloprid was somewhat intermediate in control, whether you applied it annually or triannually. But what's really interesting is that when you applied emamectin benzoate at a very low rate, uh, there was virtually no living larvae left. Similarly, if you applied it at a, at a higher at a higher rate, five mils per inch. So this tells you that applying it once every three years is enough to protect those trees from uh, emerald ash borer. So the question is, you know, how does this actually really work? So we did a study up in Culver Academy up in Northern Indiana where we injected these trees and we wanted to see how long, uh, you know, uh, uh, how much product is actually inside those leaves after we inject the trees and how does that relate to the toxicity of these products to the beetles? So what we found was that uh, uh, we injected these trees and a week later we collected leaves from the middle part of the canopy, the top part, and the top part of the canopy, and all canopy, uh, and in all all four sides. And and what we found was that uh, there was a lot, you know, there was a lot of uptake in in, in the first week. And uh, uh, this is because the, the, the tall bar means is a high concentration of emamectin benzoate. And then uh, I'm going to do this up, put get a pointer on here. Uh, shoot. Um, I guess it's not going to work. Okay, so uh, we so can then, see uh, your pointer arrow. We can see where you're pointing right now. Okay, great. Because sometimes my pointer just sort of disappears, and that drives me crazy. Okay, so <laughs> I'll go back. Okay, so in in the, this middle bar over here, you see that a month later, more product was actually accumulating. Then we went back there a year later, and uh, we see that 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 there was a sharp decline in the amount of product that's left over. This is a log scale, so basically, uh, one means uh, you know uh, means a, a, a lot more. Uh, so it's a log ten scale. So basically, uh, we have a very low amounts of. Um, so this, this is sort of an exaggerated scale, but, but, but in reality, uh, even the, a year later, after we injected it, we had enough product in there to, uh, uh, to kill the beetle, because you only need 10 parts per million in order to kill 
uh, the beetles. So this tells us that, that when you inject it in one year, you can kill beetles for two years. So uh, what does that mean in terms of preventing canopy thinning? So in this graph here, we see uh, the y-axis refers to the percent of, of canopy that was missing. And, uh, and the uh, x-axis refers to the year of the study. So in the solid line, which is the untreated control, you could see over time, uh, uh, more and more canopy uh, was lost. So in the beginning of the study, there was very little canopy missing. And in 2019, there was 60% of the canopy missing in the untreated trees. But in the trees that were treated with the mectin benzoate, they, they were protected throughout the course of the study. So if you think about this idea where you have the insecticide actively killing the insects for two years, you know, you inject in 2016 and you have this kill phase, all right? But because there's simply, there's virtually no larvae left, uh, in the next two years, you know, you're kind of coasting because you start off with very, very few larvae inside there. And then uh, in year 2019, there may be no killing activity left, but uh, the, the, the insects have to pretty much recolonize in order to uh, attack the tree. So uh, let's uh, take this concept again. We're gonna go back to that Eagle Creek site where we saw those really large trees. And here uh, we applied these tree, the insecticide in 2016. We did a fall application and a spring application. Uh, it's the same sort of a graph. The uh, top line which goes up is, uh, is you show how the trees died, uh, untreated trees uh, lost their canopy over time. The middle bar uh, with, the, with the hollow circles refers to the amount of canopy thinning on trees that were treated in the fall or September of that year. And the bottom line, uh, which is, is the canopy thinning of the trees that were uh, treated in the spring with emamectin benzoate. And so we, we go through this kill period uh, and uh, it's quite effective in 2013, 2014, even into 2015, but in 2016, we started seeing an increase in the amount of canopy thinning, which suggests that there was a very vigorous emerald ash borer population uh, at that point in that forest. And that uh, the, during the coast period, we started to actually lose some, uh, some of the canopy because the beetles were, were, were very active. Well, then we, we repeated the application in 2016, and we had a nice kill in both the fall and in the spring applied products. And that's that 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 fall application, uh, 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 excuse me, that 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 second application kept uh, killing uh, the uh, uh, the beetles, uh, and you know the population, the uh, the canopy thing continued to decline until 2019. You know, it sort of stayed stable, but in 2020, last summer when I went out to the site, I started noticing a marked uptick in uh, canopy uh, thinning again. So uh, so this is kind of interesting. Uh, you know, because you you had to ask yourself, why does it work for uh, only uh, uh, three years when I apply it in 2013, and why does it work to, for four, almost even five years when I apply it into 2016? Well, that has to do uh, with population dynamics. So uh, this graph over here uh, is, is a representative of the uh, abundance of emerald ash borer, which are these diamonds. And the, and the the light colored graph, and then the uh, uh, percentage of the affected ash, which are showing uh, uh, significant amounts of decline, and when you lose about uh, half of your when when you have uh, when you're in this uh, acceleration point where you have about uh, sixty percent of your trees have lost more than thirty percent of their canopy, uh, that's when you start seeing lots and lots of beetles around. So I think from the standpoint in 2013, you know, we applied the product early on when the population was was, was low, but in 2016, okay, when uh, the year before, uh, well, before we applied the the, 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 the the product, you know, the emerald ash borer population was really really high. And then, uh, so what happens is that uh, you have much better protection uh, later on in 2016 because it just simply isn't that much, isn't that much emerald ash borer pressure. So you think about uh, uh, applications in terms of, a, of an abrupt kill cycle where you get really good mortality in the, the two years after you apply and then you coast for a few years later. Okay. So, um, so, uh, What's interesting is that you know we can actually uh, figure out you know uh, what this means in terms of um, 
the rates of declines of forests and cities, you know, we know that they, that pretty much if you have uh, 1% of your trees being affected, the next year you're going to have 2%, and it doubles every year until 100% of the trees are affected. And this is, we sort of validated this by looking at the rate of which trees are removed from the city of Fort Wayne. And, uh, you know, uh, the same curve uh, follows if you just tracked when trees lose 30% uh, of their canopy. So, you know, we know that protecting ash trees is, is, is worth uh, the, the price um, because uh, at least in cities, you know, we, we, we know that a, a 20 inch white ash tree will give you about $230 a year in, 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 in ecosystem service benefits. Uh, we actually use uh, what we know about the decline rate of infested forests and efficacy to develop this emerald ash borer cost calculator. And uh, we just, you know, you can load in uh, an inventory of your ash trees uh, to uh, figure out uh, how much it's going to cost uh, uh, on an annual basis over a 25 year period uh, when you uh, uh, start your, um, uh, uh, your, your control uh, strategy. So what we did here is uh, I just make a comparison between uh, managing uh, street uh, street trees, if I started uh, early, uh, you know, before just when emerald ash borer was found in an area, but uh, and uh, the black line refers to the actual cost each year for just removing trees as they die. So basically, if you remove them all at one time, you got a pretty sharp peak in that black curve. Uh, the red curve over here refers to uh, spreading out the removal over the entire. Over, over an eight year period. So the, the, the actual, the annual amount is a little bit lower. And uh, if I would apply this product, uh, emomectin benzoate once every three years, what, 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 what you notice is that uh, we've got, uh, is what you notice is that we've got a, a, a lower annual costs uh, or, or stretched over, over a long period of time. The same thing happens if you start in uh, year five. Uh, except the costs seem to be a little bit more more compressed. And when you compare the cumulative costs, which you add all the costs together uh, over a 25 year period, you notice that the blue line, which is the treatment line, uh, is you wind up spending a lot less money over that over that 25 year period if you save your trees than if you remove and replace them. Now, uh, surprisingly enough, you know, uh, if you save your trees, which is the blue line, the resultant size of your forest, which we measure by the cumulative DBH of the forest, uh, is a lot larger <clears throat> than if you removed and replaced them. You know, that's common sense. So, but basically, uh, so any way you look at it, you're going to have a much bigger forest if you actually save, save, save your trees. So the question is, you know, uh, uh, can we lower control costs by uh, uh, this slowed ash mortality concept? So, uh, this is based on some work that Deb McCulloch did up in Michigan, uh, where you treat a subset of the trees. And the idea is that if your trees, if your treated trees are close enough to untreated trees, uh, the poison in the leaves will kill the adult females before they, they move on to the untreated trees. And it would slow the population buildup and that would slow the mortality. So we did tests on a, on a, on a couple of different college campuses. And uh, we looked at a couple of, identified a couple of factors that influenced uh, ash tree survival in these urban slam programs. First of all, uh, if you start early, uh, in other words, so if you can imagine uh, in, in the, that left box over here, the light blue colored canopies are healthy trees, the darker blue tree uh, with the beetles on top of them is an infested tree. If you start early, you can have a much better chance of success than if you wait until maybe half of the trees are um, are, are, are unhealthy showing some symptoms and you have a lot more emerald ash borers. And uh, this is kind of what we saw. We did, a, we did some work at IU Bloomington. Uh, we started this uh, project where we treated 40% of the trees and the uh, number of unsalvageable trees is graphed here. The dotted line refers to the trees that were treated with emomectin benzoate. And, and we found that you know, we were able to hold that number uh, fairly constant if we, if we treated these trees. It was a slight increase. But the untreated trees, the, 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 most of these untreated trees kept on increasing in terms of becoming more and more unsalvageable to about close to 90% of the trees were unsalvageable. It did slow the rate at which the untreated trees died because of the uh, 
uh, bleed over effect or the associational protection provided by the treated trees. Um, because this dotted line would refer to, if we used our doubling model, the what we would predict uh, the mortality would have been in the absence of, of, of treating trees. So it does work, but it's really not, 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 not helping uh, very much. Uh, but let's uh, look at uh, uh, Indiana State University, where we started, uh, where the uh, only 10% of the uh, of the trees had more than 30% thinning. So we were a lot earlier, early on in this uh, emerald ash borer uh, decline cycle. And what we see here is that you know, just like uh, uh, Bloomington, you treat, you protect your trees, the protected trees, most of them uh, stay fairly well protected. But um, we also found that even after uh, five years, we still had 40% of the trees remaining that were not treated. So basically 40% uh, of the trees survived purely because of associational protection. Now, uh, one of the things we found was that uh, white ash uh, seems to show its symptoms uh, much uh, later than uh, green ash. And uh, as such, you know, we found that the decline in the white ash, uh, that the survival of the white ash was a lot greater than the survival of the green ash in the Terre Haute site. So, um, so we see here this, uh, this, this black line is the survival of the untreated white ash trees. Most of them survived. This, this line here are, are the uh, treated white ash trees. And, and for green ash, because they started out more infested, uh, the, uh, they, they declined a, a, a lot more than, than, than did the white ash. So the question is, you know, if you want to do this, how close must uh, a, a treated, an ash tree be, must ash trees be for, this, for the, the uh, treated trees to protect the untreated ash trees? And we found that uh, the distance to the nearest treated ash should be around 20 meters or about 60 feet. Uh, and, uh, and so we found that uh, on the first graph, if, if you have an untreated ash within 20 meters of a treated ash, you're going to have some protective effect. Uh, and if you have an untreated ash next to an untreated ash, you'll have, uh, uh, if, it, if it's within six meters of it, you're going to have uh, a uh, more of a contagious type effect. So in summary, you know, this, this, I'll show you, this is actually a map of the Terre Haute site. The black dots are the treated trees, the open circles of the untreated trees. And we found that most of our protection occurred in this in this lower part of this area over here, where we had a high concentration of trees and uh, the trees were treated right next to each other. This, and this one street over here, uh, you know, where we had, you know, almost every other tree being treated, we could not tell the difference between a treated and an untreated tree. So here it worked really well, but in areas where the trees were much further apart, we found very little effect of the treatment on the untreated trees. So Summarizing this, you know, we can so show that, you know, when you have your trees that are close together, you're starting uh, er early, uh, you know, you're going to have a much uh, better shot at protecting the, the, the ash. So in summary, we've got, you say, start early uh, when there are few uh, uh, emerald ash, when there's, there's few trees are, are showing symptoms and there's fewer borers. Um, you're, gonna be, you're probably going to be more successful in a white ash forest and a green ash forest and make sure the trees are, are close to each other. So with that, I'll be happy to open the floor uh, for, for questions. This was done by a small army of people, as you can only imagine. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and I also wanted to call people. I put in the chat links to both the EAB cost calculator and the insecticides for emerald ash borer guide. Um, both of those are fantastic resources that I refer people to all the time. Um, so appreciate that. We um, did have some questions in the Q&A sure. that we can probably uh, get to. Um, uh, one, of, Do you see those? I'll stop sharing and okay. I'm gonna go to the Q&A, Q&A right here, okay. Okay. Flash grazing, drought, crown thinning. Okay. Uh, okay. I'll I'll go in the. Okay, Renee Frith, uh, is there any concern for the greater harm done by using neonicotinoids? Uh, there's concern, but it's not. Um, uh, the concern would be uh, for the. Imp 
so I, I guess if your concern is worrying about pollinators, uh, you know, you have to think about uh, what the how many how often pollinators are actually using the pollen from uh, the ash trees. And I think the studies that have been done show that they don't use much uh, ash tree pollen. Uh, just as an anecdotal evidence, I did inject two ash trees uh, right in the middle of the apiary at Purdue campus. And the apiary is the place where the RB specialist has uh, like 150 different hives, hits loads of hives all over the place. And there was plenty of ash pollen and I, and I treated those trees and he had absolutely no impact on his uh, bees. So, um, so I, I don't think uh, that this is a really an issue because ash trees really are, are, are wind pollinated. Acelaprin has been looked at and does not work for emerald ash borer control. Uh, the other question was about drought. Drought certainly exacerbates crown thinning. A good wet spring and early summer keeps sort of, blah, 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 blah. okay, yes. So drought uh, does exacerbate uh, crown thinning. Uh, in the graph that I had, uh, of the uh, of some of the thinning, but we actually we've actually tracked canopy thinning uh, and uh, the accumulation of trees that lost more than thirty percent of their canopy, and we started it in uh, uh, two thousand eleven. We found a big increase in the number of trees that 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 had a uh, canopy thinning in two thousand twelve, but then in two thousand thirteen, when it rained, the trees actually recovered. So you know, um, canopy thinning is helpful. But you know the, um, you know, but you know. So if you're in an area where emerald ash borer is, and the canopies are thinning, look for woodpecks, bark splits. Those are other things that you might want to take a look at as well. Okay, resistance to emmectin benzoate. Uh, you know, let's face it. Uh, resistance will occur if you if the only uh, food available are uh, trees that have been treated with emmectin benzoate. But because this product is so toxic and because we're treating such a small proportion of the ash trees, uh, MMectin benz resistance to MMectin benzoate is not gonna be very likely. Um, something about fusiform rust. I'm an entomologist, I pass. Okay, um, so uh, MMectin benzoate can be used uh, by, uh, it, you know, it, it, Emmectin benzoate, some of the new products, the new the new uh, formulations, they, a homeowner can buy them, but it's just too expensive for them to buy it uh, uh, to buy the, the the product, buy buy the material. Now, if you've got a situation where you want to do this yourself and you have a, a wood you want to manage, I would really recommend uh, picking the choice trees that you want to work with. I know Phil Marshall's on this line here. Uh, he and I, we were uh, worked with some folks at the Indiana DNR and identified some uh, large ash trees uh, in some of the state parks that we wanted to use uh, as uh, 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 sources of seed, so they could sort of sort of rain seed and keep the ash forest going. So I think that was that that was a one way of doing it. But I'm actually I'm a, I'm an not I'm an urban forester, not a forester forester. So I think that's helpful. Now, does MBEN affect woodpeckers who eat the larvae? Well. Uh, because this material is so toxic to the larvae, there are no larvae that are alive that eat emmectin benzoate. Okay, and the caterpillars that eat the leaves will also be killed by emmectin benzoate just in the first year. Uh, we know this because you have to apply once every once every year if you're trying to control control gypsy moth. Now, the question is, you know, uh, if you so let's say we have some endangered species of caterpillars feeding on ash trees, and you're worried about protecting those endangered species. I would argue that they will surely die if their only host is ash, they will surely be killed when they run out of ash trees, just as certainly as if they um, uh, would be uh, exposed to an insecticide. So I'm, I, I think that that argument is not, is not that important. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I think you've gotten to all of the questions in the Q&A, but if um, other folks have other questions that you want to ask, please do, and um, we can try to get those. There's one other thing you wanted to share. Yes, I did. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I have a, um, uh, I'll put it in, in the chat. There's a, I have uh, the app that I'm telling you about, the Purdue Plant Doctor app. Uh, it's this one's called, it's called the Purdue Tree Doctor, and it's free. 
and it's available on your smartphone, uh, on the Apple, as well as the Android version. And uh, we've got uh, recommendations on 60 different genera of trees with 200 different plant disorders. So even though we do this for urban areas, uh, a lot of the insects are, are, are the same. So, and, and we also have diseases uh, and, and other symptoms on there too as well. So it's a good first stop uh, before they call you, Ellen. Is that right? <laughs> that's wonderful. I okay, think that's yeah. great. And I, I definitely recommend folks check that out. Um, so thank you so much for talking with us today. Uh, I think as Emerald Ashbor continues to move through the state, um, it's, it's, there's new areas that it's going to impact as well as areas where it's already been for a while. So really great information for everyone um, and appreciate that.